So welcome everybody back to our uh, series aimed at helping you get into the Specialized Foundation Program, uh, a group that we're calling 123SFP. Uh, we have to give the disclaimer before we carry on, as we always do, that everything that you see and hear in this talk and the series overall, uh, or the views that you see therein are solely those of the presenters and do not reflect those of the NHS are employing trusts where we work as doctors or anything to do officially with the Specialized Foundation program. This is all our own content, our thoughts and views, and our best advice to try and help you get where you want to be. Exactly. And unfortunately, our colleague Alex is on call, um, which is why he can't join us, but he obviously did contribute to the organization and um, the slides. That's a bit about him. I'll let Ollie introduce them very, very quickly because I see a lot of people that have attended our previous talks before. Yeah, keep it really simple. Hello, everyone. My name is Ollie. I'm a, an AFP or a specialised foundation year two doctor working up in Newcastle in the northeast of England, about to rotate onto my academic block as it happens come December. Yep. And I am Aqua. I am an academic foundation one doctor. And um, what am I start? I'm currently on gen surge and I will go into stroke. Yeah, I had to think about that. First. What am I doing? What am I doing with my life? But no, Ollie, take it away. Okay, so I'm afraid that this session is going to be a bit more didactic uh, than the other ones, guys, by which I mean, it's going to be a bit more us going through lecture slides and talking at you. That's because, unfortunately, for what we're talking about today, which are some of the basics of study design, key bits of terminology that you'll need to understand research and the sessions later on, and thinking about some forms of bias, that's basically what we're covering today. And, and yeah, Aqua's raised that really important point. Any questions, uh, please let us know in the chat. Whichever one of us isn't speaking will be monitoring the chat. Um, but basically, there is no other way to go through this stuff other than talking through it. So please bear with us. We'll make it as, as understandable as possible. And anytime you don't understand, let us know. But let's start with some study designs, which are forms of experiment, ways that you can actually test clinical and scientific questions that you want to try and answer. You'll have heard a lot of these before. Hopefully, some of them are familiar. Some of them might not be. And that's OK. That's what this is all about. But a longitudinal study. Anytime you see this word, it means that that study in question is dealing with patients over time, over some longitudinal beginning to end. So you might be uh, looking after them during stay in hospital. You might track them if they are in for seven days, for example, for a surgery. You might track them during that time. You might then follow them up for six months after their surgery. If you're doing something like a big drug trial, you might do it for 10 years um, after the trial. It just means that you're doing it at more than one point in time. I'm going to go to cross-sectional next, which is actually on the other side, uh, because it's almost the opposite of that. You are capturing a snapshot of your sample cohort at one point in time. So, for example, we might want to see... Uh, if we took all of the junior doctors working on Aqua as a uh, ward, um, where she's working in general surgery, um, maybe none of them have had chance for a toilet break in the entire week, and we might want to look at their, uh, their urea and electrolyte levels. So what you could do is take a blood sample from all of them at once, and that's a cross-sectional sample you have taken a measurement of those user knees, those blood tests at one point in time for your sample population. You're not doing any follow-up or any repeat sampling at another time. It's just what is happening in the instance that we measure. Coming then to prospective, uh, that refers to a situation in which we are planning something that we are going to start measuring now and then continue measuring in the future, essentially. So if I were going to plan that study that we were just talking about, taking blood samples from those doctors, we are collecting the data uh, as we generate it. So we're taking those blood tests and analyzing the results. And we could continue to do that, continue to collect more samples. 
And because this is all stuff that is either newly happening in the now, it's not been done at some point in the past, or it's happening in the future, that's what makes it prospective data. The other side of that, again, coming to the right hand side is retrospective data. Uh, and this is dealing with data that has already been collected. So a really good example of this is something called UK Med, which is a database that tracks UK medical students. You've maybe never heard of this before, but it's a good thing to know about. It tracks medical students from the point of admission to medical school. So everything you put on your application to all the way through medical school, all your exam scores, everything that you generate, and then your practice as a doctor is all gathered into UK Med. And what we could do is say, look at everyone in this call now and look at your exam results from the first year of medical school. And that would be a retrospective analysis of data that was collected in the past. Um, uh, an explanatory, um, when we talk about something as being explanatory we are performing a study that is looking to answer a question essentially about something it's taking place in the ideal settings to actually test that hypothesis um i might ask aqua to give an example of that if she can think of of a particularly good one yeah maybe that she's been involved in um well no so unfortunately a lot of the clinical practice stuff um is pragmatic because those are the real life settings because if you want to change clinical practice you ideally want them to be pragmatic, which is on the right, rather than explanatory, um, which is more ideal settings. Uh, can't come up with an example from the top of my head right now, but say, for example, if we want to compare um, a new drug versus a placebo, that, you know, and if we were to really, really restrict our sample population and make it really, really, really so, you're only testing a very certain age and you have to make sure that they're very fit, blah, 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 blah. And you basically want to get rid of as much of much as confounding as you can um those are testing the ideal situation whereas unfortunately ideal doesn't necessarily mean practical sure. so that might be a good hospitals are a great sample of captive patient populations because they're already there um which will make them by design much easier to gather data from than recruiting a load of people into a lab somewhere um great So the next uh, important thing, and this is probably one of those things to know and remember for the purposes of your interviews specifically, this is something that you will have all seen before. It's called the hierarchy of evidence. And generally speaking, things at the bottom of the pyramid, while they may be interesting, are of less uh, clinical, I hesitate to use the word relevance, but perhaps a value is more the term. The higher you go in this pyramid, the more rock solid and certain the evidence that you generate is considered to be the highest standard of evidence. So when you're making a clinical decision about something, um, which you will often have to do as, as a junior if it's something routine, um, but you want to be as close to the top of this pyramid as possible. Um, ideally using evidence that is based on some form of randomized controlled trial or uh, a systematic review and meta-analysis of those trials. So last week we talked about uh, Aristotle, which was the trial looking at uh, warfarin and apixaban. And that's, you know, that's a great example of a, a routine clinical thing that we do every day. And it's based on that kind of evidence. Now, we were talking about this before. It's not always possible to get to the top of the pyramid, depending on the specific thing that you are dealing with. But as juniors, we are operating very closely within the NICE guidelines. We're not kind of striking out and forging new clinical pathways because that would be unsafe. So A, if you are asked to have a look at something in the context of your interview, it is much more likely to be at the top end of this pyramid. And when you're making clinical decisions, again, we should be working to as close to the top of this pyramid as we can. So get to recognize that and learn the order. Sometimes comes up in finals as well. Yeah. Um, cool. But I'll take you guys through, um, I guess, what Ollie just spoke about. Um, so a case report, experience of a single patient 
they're very easy to write and lo and behold i think some of us in the audience may have been involved in them um and they're unfortunately prone to chance association because they're sample size of one and they are prone to bias and they're observational an example is as you see right there a 19 year old man with shock multiple organ failure and a rash and just to see if you guys are um i guess tuning to tuning into our um, talks. Can anybody tell me which journal this is from just by looking at the font and, and um, the color choice by any chance? Anyone want to ha hazard a guess? Yes, well done, Catherine. And hi, Kathy. Yes, exactly. It's just the font, isn't it? Well done. For case series, experience of a group of patients, and it's really useful for studying rare diseases because some group has gone and comprised all of them of the same pathology. And it's again, observational. An example here in New England, again, case series of children with acute hepatitis and human adenovirus infection. And you're very, I don't think you're likely to get these two um, in your interview. Yeah. Total of 15 children were identified, all with acute hepatitis. Cohort study, this is more likely to show up. Um, and the reason why and what they'll ask you in your interview is why it'll be useful. And you need to understand that, you know, you're specifically looking at two groups, usually. One group is exposed to a risk, and then you compare that with another group that's not exposed to a risk. And then you follow up to see who develops your chosen condition. So for example, if you're looking at a group of smokers versus non-smokers, and you wanna see who's um, developing lung cancer, you would perform a cohort study. How, and however, in all of these things, you need to come up with like little buzzwords or rote things that you just need to spit out. And for the disadvantages of your study design, you would say, unfortunately, cohort studies do take a long time, they're expensive, and they are at really, really high risk of dropout. And they will actively be looking to see if you say attrition bias, because cohort study, because you're following them up, um, unfortunately, you are less, you are more likely to lose um, candidates along the way. And yes, usually it is prospective. However, I have heard of some retrospective um, studies where they look back, but that's not common. For case control studies, this is kind of the opposite, where you already have cases versus a control group, and the case group will have the outcome that you're already looking, that you want to see, and then you're retrospectively looking at the risk factors to see what exposes the group of patients to that particular condition. So, for example, in well, a similar example to the thing that I said before, if you compare a group with lung cancer versus without lung cancer, you want to ask everyone what they were exposed to. And that's how you can assess risk factors. And it's really useful to investigate new diseases and they tend to be quick and cheap. However, the previous one was a risk of attrition bias. Case control are a risk of recall bias because you're trying to depend on your candidates or patients memory, essentially. And if you ask me what I had for breakfast five days ago, I won't be able to tell you. So, you know, think about that. Cross-sectional study. Um, so as Ollie said, it is a snapshot of a population. And unfortunately you can't really determine a cause and effect relationship because you're just looking at a snapshot. And unfortunately, again, they don't have follow-up. And again, when I'm mentioning all of these things, you need to like make sure that when it comes to um, if they ask you, tell me, uh, tell me to summarize the study, you will talk about the PICO that we went over the first week, and then you will go into analyzing what type of study design it was, and then you will go into the pros and cons, and you will go into the gener generic ones, because that is what gets you the marks, because as soon as they listen to you, they'll be like, okay, this person knows what they're talking about, fine. And then you can really shine by picking out particular things in the abstract. And an example of a cross-sectional study is learn. Um, don't pay attention to the authorship line at all. Uh, but this is an example of a cross-sectional snapshot of urology teaching across all UK medical schools. Now, 
this is the study design that you will most likely be asked um, an RCT. And this is pretty much your gold standard for studying treatment effects. Patients tend to be randomized to treatment arms. And when it comes to disadvantages, it's difficult, it's very time consuming, it's expensive. These involve ethical approval and masses and masses of efforts from different like organizations and different groups. And you know, it's, it's potentially ethical. And this is where you can bring in what we've discussed last week, equipoise. Um, and you have to consider blinding as well. This is an example of an RCT where you compared antibiotics with appendectomy for appendicitis. And again, the beautiful journal New England. Now, the next few study designs are kind of rogue. However, they have come up in interviews, so they are important to talk about. A crossover trial is when patients receive a treatment and then switch to the other treatment halfway through the study. This is how you can assess which treatment works better. And in all of these, they should have a washout period. And this is something that they can ask you to really assess you to see if you know what you're talking about. A washout period is basically a tiny little period of time where you want to minimize carryover effects. For example, half-life, withdrawal effects, just to make sure that um, the drug is completely cleared renally and um, hepa hepatically, is that the word? I'm not sure, from your liver. And crossover trials are very useful for rare diseases where if there is a lack of patients, it could actually make a trial underpowered because each, of, each patient now will be providing two times the data because of the crossover. And um, a really cool thing is that the same patient is in both treatment arms, so they are actually matched with themselves. So it's a really cool study design. An N of one. So this came up, uh, I, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but it came up in our interviews with um, London last year. And an N of one, this, this caught out a lot of people, unfortunately, the study design. But this is when you have a single patient receiving repeated courses of an intervention or treatment and control in a random or alternate order. And it's kind of a similar to a crossover trial, but instead it's just a single patient. And it's really useful for determining what works best for that patient. And it is actually common in pain studies. However, it can take a really long time. And audits, I don't want to dwell on this because it's very unlikely you will have this in your interview. Um, and this is more to do with your standard um, foundation program because everybody, it is part of our GMC um, requirements that we have to take part in order cycle. But how it may come up is um, when, if they ask you, how would you, I guess, distinguish between order and research? And you would say that, audits really compare the current standard and that's how they analyze to see if um, our current standard is matching gold standard guidelines or local protocols for example whereas research tends to look at something new that's pretty much um, the biggest difference that you will say systematic reviews and meta-analyses at the very top 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 if they're obviously comprising and if they're um, analyzing uh, RCTs that is at the very top because they will pretty much systematically review every single um, thing on that topic in that little refined um, question that you want to ask. A meta-analysis is combining the results um, of the results, if that makes sense, of a systematic review, and you usually have like a quant assessment. And just so that I can stop listening to myself for a second, can anybody tell me what type of plot this is? and to, to see if you guys are still listening to me. Yeah, exactly, good. So with forest plots, can anybody try to tell me um, what this shows was brave enough? Just by looking at it, what can you determine? Let's say left favors placebo and right favors um, intervention. 
does anybody want to just hazard a guess? Yeah, it favors intervention. And can anybody tell me if it's a significant or non-significant finding? And how would you know as well? Yeah, why is it significant, Amanda? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So looking at this, Smith and I guess other, well, wow, both Smith um, studies unfortunately showed non-significant effects, right? Because they crossed the one line. Yeah, exactly. Whereas the rest, well, Jones, ugh, I'm not sure if that really counts because it just touches one, but the others definitely, right? And that just shows you the value of the meta-analysis because when you're um, putting them all together, you've shown that whatever this intervention is, is actually um, significant. Now, this is quite important. And as usual, we will put up the recording for you guys, um, but it's important to understand the research pathway because they might ask you what type of um, phase a uh, certain abstract is for. Um, and I don't want to dwell on this because of, you know, the interests of time, but sometimes they may give you a phase one study to look at or a phase two. And you need to know um, what phase is testing what specifically. So like in phase two, you want to determine the safety, whereas a phase four, okay, you know that it's already passed the marketing authorization, so you want to see and you want to really assess the side effects, you know? Yeah, Manasi, exactly. But I'll hand it back over to my colleague again. Okay. Well, I'm going to take you through the less interesting half of the talk, um, guys, but we're actually doing really well for time. So there, there should be plenty of time to discuss this more at the other end of things. So... In the second half, we're going to be talking about bias, and it's a really, really common um, term in research, and I think it's very reasonable to be asked about it. I was certainly asked about it um, in my interviews. Aqua, if you can reveal, do you think it's relevant? Yeah. It is. Um, yes. That's why we're talking about it, man. Yes, yeah, so no, I, I wasn't sure whether they directly asked about it, but... Um, it means various things depending on the specific context you're talking about, but we're going to be talking about medical research here. So there are lots of different ways of trying to summarize what exactly bias is. This is my very ramshackle attempt at like 11 p.m. last night, um, which is a systematic error. So it's a form of error in either collection of data or the analysis of that data once you've got it, which leads researchers or the people that are interested in asking a question to deviate from the truth. That's kind of the my best summary of it. And the word systematic there is important because it means that it's it's generated by the way that we do things. It's it's um, something that that is inherent to the process that we're trying to carry out. That's what I'm trying to to capture in there. So what's really important is that these eight that we've got on screen here, uh, we've already mentioned some of them tonight in Aqua's part of the talk. These are not like the eight that I think everyone should know. These are eight examples of biases that may appear or may not appear in different studies. I think the best thing to do, and, and I'd invite Aqua's thoughts on this as well, is go away and read about common types and sources of bias in experimentation, because there are loads, there are so, so many, and there are often umbrellas of categories within categories, you know, this effect will be some form of bias, which, which is itself a category of different biases. But this is just about trying to get you introduced to the terms and, and what they mean. No, and um, I'd like to say that there are so many different types of biases, but I think these eight at a minimum, you should be able to just like recite them in your sleep. And I'm only saying this because I know the caliber of the candidates that we have listening to us today. <laughs> 
Mm. Yeah. So before we jump into some definitions, because we're going to give you a definition and an example for each, trying to put them in context. But the thing we've got to understand is that bias is, it is inescapable. You, you cannot eliminate bias. It's impossible. It is a side effect to a degree of, of our own cognitive processes of being human, and it affects everything that we do. You'll have heard about cognitive biases before and how they affect us in the workplace you know, how we relate with our colleagues. It's not just research. So the best thing that we can do is we have to design our experiments really, really carefully to try and eliminate as many forms as bias as possible, or at least reduce the effects of them. But the most important thing is that we acknowledge that, that the bias exists and then try to mitigate for it and try and learn from it rather than just wave it under the rug and assume that it doesn't exist because it does. Um, oh, and I would just like to add um, a very yeah. important topic um, that was just on the slide a second ago. Um, yes, we can basic, we can try our best to eliminate bias as much as possible. But a very good point is just by throwing in that keyword again, um, PPI, you want to get as multi, as many perspectives as you can and just mentioning that yeah. that you'd like to look into the paper or the research project ppi how involved were they um that really shows that patients are at the center of your care and just by saying that again it's all about brownie points it's all about making the holistic researcher that you can be and you want to be right yeah okay so this is this is like one of the the biggest ones, one of the most important ones, and, and the one of the easiest ones to start with, selection bias. Sometimes it's called a sampling bias, but a general summary of what it is, it's when you are intending to collect a random sample from within a population, but you design your experiment unwittingly in such a way that makes it so that certain members of that test population are more likely to be selected than others, right? So the example that I've given here is you want to measure how long a university student spends on social media from your population, but you only advertise for participants for your study on TikTok and no other platform. Now, for the uninitiated, TikTok is a platform that exclusively does short form video content and that's all it does so the population of people that uses tiktok may have very different social media usage habits compared to people who use facebook or youtube or um, snapchat or whatever else you can tell i'm old <laughs> um be who real uses snapchat? Uh, i don't know <laughs> um but the the point is that you you know, someone who uses YouTube a lot, if they, if you had them as part of your stakeholder group, your PPI group could step in and say, well, I only use YouTube and I use it to watch documentaries, which means that their usage is going to be very different. So it's, uh, it's just a reminder to, if you're going to try and select a population everyone within that population has to have an equal chance of being selected. Otherwise it's going to skew your data. And that's what we call a selection bias. So the next one is called a response bias. And this is a, this is a group, an umbrella term of different biases, but response bias appears when you are asking a participant to respond to something. Now, most of us will be familiar with something called the Likert scale, uh, which is uh, the thing that you see where it's usually five points between strongly disagree and strongly agree or rate this thing from one to five or whatever. You're asking someone for their feelings on something. And it's essentially a series of biases that come from different places that make participants more likely to give you false or inaccurate false or inaccurate information which which are not the same thing um but data that is not true um and a really easy example is something called courtesy bias 
and it's where a participant will alter the answer that they give you so as not to appear discourteous, impolite, or unfriendly. So you can example, right? Uh, you can imagine that, let's say, uh, I go to a restaurant and a waiter comes and brings me a feedback form and puts it in front of me and stands there while I fill it out saying, how much did you like the food? You know, rate it from one to five, one to five, one My to five. My tip depends on this, and please. There. Yeah, yeah. And they're stood there watching me. Now, simply by the fact that they have given me this thing and are asking me to respond to it in that particular situation, it massively influences the data that I'm going to give them. I might say that everything's fine. I loved it. When in reality, it was awful. But it's uh, that's just one example of a form of response bias. When you ask someone for something, you've got to be sure that they can, that they are safe to give you an honest answer that won't influence anything else about their life. Yeah, so when it comes to a study that has, for example, validated questionnaires, you want to make sure that um, the patients are either pseudo anonymized or anonymized so that they can really give you their true responses without feeling embarrassed or ashamed or, you know, courtesy bias, as Ollie said. So in the example of, because I'm very interested in neurology, if I want to look at erectile uh, mm. function, I definitely want to make sure that they have a safe space to really express and answer the questions, right? Yeah. So the example of that shouldn't be the surgeon who did the operation should not be the one asking them for how they're doing because they're more likely to, to lie. Um, reporting bias is then, as the name suggests, uh, another series of biases that appear at the reporting stage when we are looking at publishing our data. Um, and this is really important, actually, because it leads to a skew in what other scientists, our colleagues and the public ultimately see. And I'm, I'm sure it's really easy to imagine why the consequences of that can be really significant and disastrous. So an example which you may have heard of is publication bias. And it has been shown in its own statistical experiments that the single biggest predictor, the single biggest thing you can do to ensure that your paper is published is to have positive results for the question that you are asking. And that, that should really speak volumes. If the single biggest predictor of, of a study even being published is a positive result, that means that studies that either show inferiority, which we've discussed before, or that are a negative result, you know, does our tablet work or does using antibiotics prior to surgery or something change anything about the outcome? And the answer is no, we're unlikely to ever see that paper. Yeah, it's not sexy, um, is it? It's not hot. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's not interesting. It might be very valuable to, to patients, but maybe not very interesting to a journal. Uh, so then confirmation bias, again, you'll have heard of probably is the tendency to seek out data or results that agree with things that we already think, basically, which is just a very human thing. Um, and you might consider this when you are collecting data as part of a study. If you think, I don't know, that preoperative warming or something was going to help patient outcomes in your group and then you found that it didn't make any difference you might be tempted to simply think well it should work the science says it should work so the fact that it doesn't work when i measure it is probably just experimental error i'll disregard that result and run the experiment again <laughs> until it um it gives me the result that i was expecting yeah, that's, that's not and, good. That sounds like me in like, um, year six, when I kept on rolling the dice just to prove a point. Like, that's not good. Yeah. Yeah. Aqua's mentioned this one already, recall bias, which is, uh, it only appears, obviously, when we're dealing with retrospective data about things that happened in the past. So, and it's relying on human memory of a particular exposure so the example that i've given is if we were doing 
a retrospective analysis, remember that's data that happened in the past, for causes of testicular cancer in a cohort study. Again, so we're looking at people who received one exposure compared to those that, that didn't. Um, it's been shown that people with cancer, I, I was reading a study about breast cancer um, that was specifically to do with this the other day, where people who have cancer are much, much more likely because of their situation to sit down, reflect on what's happened in the past and thoroughly search their memory for different exposures. So that might be things like asbestos, like smoking, like exposure to radiation, like, oh yeah, I had a CT scan for something else at that time. They are much better at remembering specific events than men without cancer um, who would be your control group because why would they? Like, I don't remember what happens to me each and every day because I'm well and there's no reason to do that. Um, so therefore my memory compared to somebody who is who is sick or suffering from a major condition is likely to be much worse when we're asking about exposures to particular things. Now, this is a really interesting one, um, something called the Hawthorne effect, which is a it's one of a series of phenomena that occur in experimental conditions when someone realizes that they're being watched, basically, or being monitored. So a really easy example would be if you were wanting to monitor, you have 50 patients, uh, maybe you're a GP, and you're wanting to, to monitor 50 of your uh, patients at home and look at their blood glucose levels, and you give them a monitor and say, I want you to go and measure your blood glucose, you know, every morning, seven o'clock, whatever. Um, if you tell them that that's what the the machine is measuring and saying, I want you to use this to measure your blood glucose. Um, if they're aware of that, at least some of those participants are going to alter their behavior because they're being monitored. So they might change their eating habits because they want to score well on, on the result because you're going to moan at them about their blood glucose if it's too high. Um, they may uh, change their sleep patterns. They may start exercising more to, to fiddle around with that number. And it applies in virtually every experimental circumstance. Um, and then this one, observer expectancy, is it's similar to response biases that we've discussed before, but it's instead to do with the researcher and the expectations that the researcher has sort of pushing their expectations onto a participant in an experiment. So in a double-blinded RCT, we've discussed before, neither the researcher, the person giving the tablet, or the patient who is receiving the tablet knows which one it is that the patient is receiving. However, if I, for example, think that I'm giving, I'm the researcher, and I think that I'm giving them the active ingredient, the test drug. And it's to do with subtle behavioral things. Like I might say, oh, this tastes good, doesn't it? Or I bet you feel great now, don't you? Or the other way around, the patient says, this one makes me feel really good. And I go, yeah, I think it does too. Um, it's, uh, it's basically expectancy behaviors from the researcher will subtly influence the outcomes and the behaviors that the patient shows. So it's, it's again, a reminder to do your RCTs properly. And then I think this is the last one that I'm going to talk about, which is called availability bias. And again, quite simple. It's the tendency that humans have basically to rely on data and information that is most easily and readily available to us. So let's say that I was going to do a literature review on, I don't know, like prostate cancer outcomes or something that um, Aqua will know a lot about. Uh, let's say that I am a researcher for uh, a university and my university is not allied to a big prostate cancer center. So it doesn't have subscriptions to several of the big urology journals. Um, 
but there are some really big and important studies that have been published in other urology journals that I don't have access to. If I'm going to do a proper literature review, I need access to those big recent trials. I can't just use the papers and the studies that are easily available to me that are at an arm's length and my university has access to. It would be tempting and it's unlikely necessarily that someone would spot what I had done, at least for quite a long time, maybe when it got to peer review. But um, it's just basically do your research properly. Yeah. And like <laughs> is, uh... um, on a similar vein, I mentioned this, I, I think maybe two sessions ago, the Tower of Babel, remember bias, where if you're excluding um, languages that aren't English, Again, it's kind of similar availability bias. You're not using the true data um, available around that, ev you know, that evidence or that topic. But now I briefly want to talk about confounding and essentially a confounding variable, as I'm sure a lot of you know, is a third variable in a study examining a potential cause and effect relationship. An example of this could be if you're trying to look at um, the rate of ice cream consumption compared to the number of sunburns, obviously the confounding is hot temperature. And um, can anybody give me an example of another confounding factor? It can be a really simple one, to just, just so that, again, we get some sort of engagement because I realize that we're just talking at you rather than with you. Yeah, exactly. Living next to the beach is probably going to make sure that you're going to be sunburned because you're going to be more likely to spend more time. Yeah, exactly. So how can you battle confounding? And these are, again, just methods that you can just rattle off when you're talking about it. So with restriction, you basically restrict your group by only including subjects with the same values of the potential confounding factors. So for example, if you want to look at um, whether a low carb diet causes weight loss, since you know that age, gender, education, exercise intensity are all factors that might be associated with weight loss, you choose to restrict your subject to uh, your subject pool to only 45 year old women with bachelor's degrees who exercise at moderate levels of intensity between 100 to 150 minutes per week. So yes, it's relatively easy to implement, but it restricts your sample size a great deal and it actually lets you on to potentially even more confounders if you restrict it that much. When it comes to matching, if we use the same example, you match up your subjects based on age, gender, level of education, whatever, and you get to include a wider range of subjects but each subject on a low carb diet is matched with another subject with the same characteristics who's not on the diet. So for every 40 year old um, highly educated man who follows a low carb diet, you find another 40 year old highly educated man who does not. Then you compare the weight loss between the two subjects and you do this for all the subjects in your treatment sample. So you can include more subjects than in the restriction method, but it can be difficult to implement because you need to find pairs. And that's not really ideal, is it? With statistical control, um, it's easy to implement and it also can be performed after data collection. And this is when, this is more to do with stats, which we'll talk about in another session, but this is where you confound and you add your possible confounders as variables in your regression model. So that's more stats heavy, if that makes sense. So. When it comes to um, your regression model, you would add age, sex, blah, 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 as different variables and um, mathsy bits, which again, we'll talk about another time. But I think the most common thing that we'll see in our SFP interviews is randomization. So huge, huge, huge group of subjects, and you just randomize the whole group, um, and half of them will be the low carb diet, and the other half of them will be the normal eating habits and it will allow you to have, account for all possible confounding factors, including the ones that you may not actually observe directly, 
and it may be the best method for minimizing the impact of the different confounders. However, as you know, an RCT, a random, randomization in general, is difficult to carry out. And um, you need to make sure that the ones that are allocated to the treatment group receive the treatment, which, again, might be a bit difficult. Now, this is obviously something that you will inherently know because you read this in your methods in the abstract, right? Um, but this is, again, something that you need to be mindful of. Because when you're reading an abstract, it's not going to give you all the information about inclusion and exclusion criteria. So this is another example of where you can show off and be like, you would like to look into the full paper to really assess the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So on the screen right now, bad example, subjects will be included if they have insomnia. Okay, cool. That's kind of vague. How are you going to establish? How, what do you define as insomnia? Whereas a good example would be, they will be included in the study if they've been diagnosed by a doctor and they've had symptoms for at least three nights a week for a minimum of three months. It's very, very clear the diagnosis, the symptoms, and you're specifying the time frame to make sure that the condition is more likely to be stable throughout the study. And again, this will all make sure that the internal validity is intact and that will make your evidence stronger because you can actually draw more likely conclusions from it. Exclusion criteria. Bad example, subjects will be excluded if they're taking medications. Okay, that's pretty much everyone. I would be excluded because I take caffeine, you know? It's too broad. There are many, many, many different forms of medication and it will definitely interfere with study results. Good example, subjects will be excluded from study if they're currently on any medication that affects their sleep or any other drugs that uh, in the opinion of the research team that may interfere with the results of the study. So yes, that, that probably makes more sense, like gabapentin or something that is known to make you drowsy, like codeine. That is logical. Now, we've been talking about, me and Ollie and um, Alex have been talking about these three terms quite a lot, but I think it's important if we just briefly discuss this a bit, and at least it only made sense to me when I saw a graph. But briefly, because you will see this again and again and again, um, a superiority trial is when the intervention proves to be better than your control. An equivalence trial is seeing if the intervention is equal to the control. A new drug is not unacceptably different compared to the current standard there is. Non-inferiority is essentially the intervention is not worse than the control. So it may be meaningfully less effective compared to the standard, but that lost effic efficacy is acceptable to us because it may in the longer run be cheaper and it might be a suitable um, replacement for the current standard that we have. So this really made sense to me. We set a non-inferiority margin in which anything on the left can indicate that the standard, what we have right now is better. And then after the zero line, we can conclude that the treatment is better. If it falls between the non-inferiority margin and the positive, positive non-inferiority margin, it's equivalent, it's basically equal. If it's anything above the non-inferiority margin, then we can declare it as non-inferior. If it truly lies above the zero line, we can conclude that it's superior. And I would really reflect and take a, you know, a decent amount of time of looking at this so you truly understand the differences. But because these, these terms will be second nature to you when you're a working clinician. Um, giving it back to all. Yeah, I'm just going to go through this really quickly as we draw things to a close. But these these are terms that you will have heard before. But these, again, should be rattling off your tongue because these are the the very bare bones um, version of, of everything that we're talking about here. And you may be asked, you know, if you were to design an experiment for X, what would be your hypothesis? What would be your alternative hypothesis? what would be the null hypothesis, which we'll talk about. So a hypothesis is a, is a supposition 
an assumption made based on the evidence that you already have without any assumption of truth. And that's that's the key thing. It is an assumption, not a dictum, not a certainty. So it might be laparoscopic surgery requires smaller incisions than open abdominal surgery. Therefore, the rates of post-operative infection should be less in laparoscopic surgery when compared to open surgery. It kind of makes sense within itself its form of inductive reasoning but there is no assumption made of truth and so you would have to design an experiment uh, a study that would tell you the answer and that's called the hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis they they are the same thing the thing you are testing whereas the null hypothesis is uh, it's that there is no significant difference between the two tested populations and that any observed difference between those two populations, so it might be infection rates in open abdominal surgery patients compared to laparoscopic surgery patients for appendicectomy, any difference in infection rate between those two groups is due to either experimental error, that is something that we're doing, or random chance. There is no experimental evidence for a difference. And I briefly want to talk about these because I think they are very, very important. And I alluded to this previously as well in our, you know, a different top talk that we did. But a composite endpoint is a bunch of individual endpoints combined to make an overarching umbrella endpoint. For example, if a study, as you see on the screen, investigates a drug to try and prevent a vascular ischemic event, it might combine rates of MI, stroke, death, rehospitalizations to form a composite endpoint. And it's really important to assess these, um, but the process of evaluating these is, I want to just you know remind you that it's different when you look at surrogate endpoints. With surrogate endpoints, you're looking at the causal flow to determine the legit the, the legitimacy I guess is, is that the correct word I think of the surrogate endpoint so we can mark and try to I guess analyze LDL formation because we kind of know that it could lead to oh that should say plaque not plague formation um, which could allude to MI if that makes sense because it might for us be easier to analyze LDL formation by looking at the like triglyceride and TG, like all of those components and cholesterol components in our blood, rather than MI straight on, because that might not even be ethical to be like, let's just wait to see how many patients of ours have MIs, you know? So that's the difference between surrogate and composite. Composite matches them all up, which is very, very common in cardiovascular um, studies. So if, for example, if you get one, um, in your interview, you will be like, I note that they use a compass outcome, um, which is a combination of X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. And you would like, and then you can say, and I note that they've also used a surrogate endpoint, which is possibly looking at something else to infer some sort of causal relationship to the actual outcome, which is most likely the rate of MI, if that makes sense. Now, I've, this is for your own learning. And again, this is for, um, for you to study just advantages and limitations. And I want you to go ahead and read this um, because this is more, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather you read them rather than me explaining them to you. Because we are getting close to the end of, you know, our talk. Are there any questions and answers? And um, when you watch the recording, you can just play back and like pause it there. Yeah. But yeah. We'll maybe hang around for about five minutes, guys, and then end on time and let you uh, let you back to your evenings. And just as usual. Please, 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 could you provide some feedback? Please, 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 please. Um, Literally anything. Amanda's asked, uh, 
I, I think there's a word missing. Yeah. How, how do how do they ask you about it? I mean, we'll each have had different experiences. So what what do you think? Yeah, sure. So in London, for example, they it'll be specific and it'll be very examiner dependent. So for mine, they were really trying to pluck each little, I guess, brain cell that I had in me. It's fine, it's fine, Amanda. Um, so they would ask me, okay, what do you think about um, the sample? What do you think about their randomization process? What do you think about their blinding? They're trying to extract it out of you and they're looking to see if you will say those buzzwords. Whereas some examiners will be like, describe the study, nothing. Zilch. They don't give you anything. They give you just their blank expressions. And you need to be able to read the abstract and be able to be like, okay, okay, so this kind of means that this could be leading to selection bias. Oh, okay, this could be leading to recall bias. You know, you need to just think about the study design and associate it with a particular bias. That's how they would ask you. Whereas I know Ollie, for example, uh, you had a different experience. Yeah, I you? did. So mine, um, just as with the critical appraisal stuff that I, that we talked about last week, um, my stuff was all almost done backwards, in the sense that it was it was all very prospective. If you were going to design an experiment to answer this clinical, oh, it was kind of done even more backwards than that. It was this is the clinical question how would you design an experiment or a study to answer this question? And as part of that, it would be, how do you eliminate certain forms of bias that you could be asked? So it might be, how do you eliminate selection bias from this thing? Or in the form of pushback, if I said, you know, I will, I will give all of the patients in my study a questionnaire that that I want them to fill out and they you know that examiner as Aqua said could turn around and challenge me and say okay well now you've got a study that's full of uh, response bias so what are you going to do about it <laughs> or how are you going to change what you've done it's I think it's fair to say that again the point of this and what we're trying to get across is that it, it's not about always rote remembering although there are some of these definitions that you definitely do have to wrote, remember, but really it's more plastic and fluid than that. And it's designed to test your thinking and understanding. Can you apply these rules that we've talked about in an unfamiliar context? Yeah, uh, exactly. So I think it's very examiner dependent, but they'll really try. You need to be able to have some sort of understanding of them for them to test you on the spot. In terms of a structure to use, oh, hi, Becky. Um, in terms of a structure to use for answering structures on this, should we start with discussing the generic points and then this, yes, exactly. No, I would, hunt if you had time, I would go into making sure that you truly understand the study design first, go generic first, then go specific. Because you will get marks for nailing the generic points first. Anything above that, they'll be like, oh, oh wow, okay, that, that's impressive. Yeah, never go beyond, I guess, without covering the basics, because that's where the marks truly are, Becky. Uh, Jonathan has just asked, where can we view the recordings of the previous sessions? Um, good question. They're just saved on Medal, aren't they? Yeah, I thought so too. If you request yeah. catch up content, I think you should be able to watch it because we make the recordings accessible. But also, Ollie um, is uploading them onto his YouTube. But please yeah, do the so, feedback. Yeah, so they are. Um, oh, yeah, they are on your main page. Oh, thank <laughs> um, you, Amanda. Yeah, so they're either on here or. Uh, if you want to give us a bit of advertising kickback, they're, they're on my YouTube as well. You can view them in either place. Uh, yeah. and then, but no one cares about your YouTube. I'm no joking. one cares about my YouTube. I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, Saren, Saren was saying, uh, is was observer expectancy bias in relation to open label or double blind studies or both? 
it's much more general than that, Sarah, and it's a psychological principle. It, it applies in any study where the researcher is interacting with an observed participant. If, you, if you're watching them doing something, it's about how, how the observer subconsciously influences the behavior of the person being observed. That's what it means. So it, it could apply in, in any of, of the studies. The example that I gave was a double blinded study, but it applies in, in a huge range of possible studies and anything where you have an observer that is watching someone in an observed study. Um, so it, it's, it's similar to the Hawthorne effect, which was the, th the thing that people change their behavior when they know they're being observed. But instead of coming from the person themselves, it comes from the researcher as a, as a subtle influence over their behavior. But uh, I think we'll wrap it up there. Yeah, let's just leave it for another two minutes to see if there's any more questions because there was That's... a lot of information to be there. Yeah, there was a lot. Um, I, I'm <laughs> I'm trying to get away. I've got another meeting literally now. Um, yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, are you okay to hold the fort for two minutes then if I disappear? Goodbye. Bye. I'll leave you all in Aqua's very capable hands. Um, take care, guys. Thank you for coming. Hi guys, um, yeah, I'll leave it open for another couple of minutes, uh, and please, please, please do the feedback unless you have any more questions, which of course I will be able to answer. I hope. We're just very keen on making sure that all of this information is available to you because we know that these are the things that will give you the brownie points or like the top tips that we wish we heard when we were in your position last year. I'm guessing no more questions. And if that's the case, please do um, follow us on Twitter or social media um, because very, very happy to answer all of your questions there as well. But yeah, I hope to see you guys in the next one. Thank you very much.